Om Kalindi Fula Kamale Madhavena Kritarata Brahmananda Navastubhyam Sadguru Lokanayaka Om Shantihi 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 Salutations to Swami Brahmananda, the true teacher and leader of mankind, who is ever immersed in sportive play with Sri Krishna on the full blown lotus flower on the Kalindi River. Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharda, Brahmananda, Vivekananda, Om Kalima, Om Kalima. So on a suspicious Saturday, which is Swami Brahmananda's birthday, <clears throat> we salute those great beings who have come before us and taught us the Vedanta, shared it with us here in, in the West. Uh, that's kind of unprecedented when you, you think of all the great souls of India who have, who have taught it inside of India, like Shankara and others. <clears throat> and uh, Lord Buddha, who taught it inside of India, but then beings who accepted it, took it out into the world. And just like Swami Vivekananda did. And though Swami Brahmananda never came to the West, uh, he remained there in India as the president of the Ramakrishna Martin mission. And so we remember him fondly on this day and chant those beautiful slokas to him that have been written uh, and that we use in our SRE pujas all the time. <clears throat> so this is our Saturday satsang on Swami Brahmananda's birthday. And we will go on for an hour and then have an hour's break and then an hour God blogs, Brahman bites, discussion on those four or five new God blogs I hope you all read that I posted Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday last week or earlier this week. And so we always have something circulating in our mind, sort of like have good air circulating around you all the time. You need that. The mind also needs that good air and atmosphere to circulate in its inside of it all the time so that uh, Dharma can flourish there and our minds can remain high above the not just the commonplace and superficial thoughts of every day but even escape the lower terms of thought that so many people are suffering nowadays in this world in what we call the Kali Yuga the fourth of the four yugas where <clears throat> intelligence is pretty much lost to most minds and uh, people are not acting like themselves, acting as everything other than themselves. So we want to keep our peace of mind because Holy Mother said that's first and foremost, any actions that you do in restlessness of mind or laziness of mind accrue karma and they come back at you but if you can keep at least a balanced state of mind, not only will that karma that comes back will be positive, but uh, on top of that, you can use that balanced state of mind, which we call sattva or sattva guna as a springboard into higher mind and its thoughts. Sometimes uh, Shankara has pointed that out in the Viveka Chudamani as, as pure sattva or sattva shuddha, uh, and the seers value that pure mind uh, almost higher than anything else. As Sri Ramakrishna said, pure mind is God. So if we keep that high-minded state all the time and, and uh, make sure that we don't fall out of it, that our default zone at least is just harmonious or balanced state of mind, then there's this possibility of higher states of mind, which, as you know, there are many words for in India, like nirvana and nirvikalpa, samadhi. 
So that's awaiting the sincere spiritual aspirant who keeps a state of mind that's even. Krishna calls that stiti pragnasha in the Gita and mentions it uh, a good half dozen times. It's a part of that yoga that Sri Krishna recommends to us amongst the four yogas. So here on Swami Brahmananda's birthday, I hope you have done some readings and maybe have come to satsang with some questions or something to share by the way of insights. Insights and foresights are better than hindsights, we know. I should have done this or I should have done that. It's better to uh, look forward to something that's powerful or better yet even to live in the eternal moment beyond past, present, and future, where insights are rising in the minds of great souls all the time. How does the yogi conduct his mind and its projections is the question. He conducts them by watching them rise and fall in, in that balanced state of mind and dissolving back like bubbles into water. Buddhascha yata jale, as the great Nandu scriptures of India state. So that's a state of mind we have been referring to a lot lately uh, by the words witness consciousness or sakshi bhutam. Sankara tells us to dissolve the word into the mind and the mind into the intellect, intellect into the ego, and ripen the ego and dissolve that into the witness. That witness is called sakshi bhutam. And speaking of default zones, it's probably the best way to look both outwards and inwards. That is what Sharma Krishna used to call Shiva Yoga and Vishnu Yoga. That is, uh, you can, from that witness standpoint, look inward towards the Atman. You could also look outward towards the worlds of name and form in time and space, and therefore hold that balanced position philosophically, not just gunically. So that's what we attempt I'm calling that lately Mott and Mission Impossible. So uh, that's what we're trying to do with, with this um, great philosophy called Vedanta that's uh, been brought to us by Swami Vivekananda, none other than that great soul Swami Vivekananda here amongst us in the late 1800s and early 1900s. What a way to bring in a century and so same for us here in the 2020 vision year, which has just passed as we try and gather beings from all over the world and uh, bring them together in one place, even if it isn't physically, at least we can have this, this state of mind together uh, virtually as they say, and maybe give a, a double entendre kind of meaning to the word virtually and make, turn it into an actual state of communion and darshan over these mechanisms that's, that have been granted to us. So maybe over this mechanism, as I see some dozen people have gathered this morning, who can come forward with uh, a first offering for satsang today? I know many of you are taking the yoga classes from me and reading the gospel and other scriptures. Yes, Erica. Namaste, Babaji. So this Namaste. week, kind of, I've been thinking more about the subtleties of the ego and the ways that attraction and aversion can sort of sneak into our routines. So I was kind of thinking about the way that uh, in our sadhana and our routine, we can sort of start to cling to that and it can sneak in in that way. And then aversion can come up during thoughts and meditation and everything. And it seems that if we had realized that we weren't the doer, that that really wouldn't be an issue. So my question is, is, realize, is the realization come from direct experience? Or does that realization come from direct experience? Well, there's probably nothing on earth that doesn't come more fully than 
through direct experience. Um, that's even beyond book learning, as Sharon Chris used to say, and beyond the intellectual uh, contemplations of of the priest class and so forth. Uh, he, if you read the Gospel of Sharon Krishna, he likes you to jump in at that level of direct spiritual experience. So it's that's why it's such a uh, a complete manual for spiritual life. People not only just of the Ram Krishna order, but all over the world, monks and householders and devotees of different religions even, even value the gospel of Sharm Krishna already in a very short time. Uh, uh, that didn't really happen to the Old and New Testaments and when they got into the more modern ages or the Quran and so forth. Uh, but in the case of Sharm Krishna's gospel, a very quick recognition of of a great soul that was on earth and was uh, a light am amidst the darkness. So more specifically then to your question, it's, you're asking it in, in terms of how the ego insinuates on meditation. Is that what I'm understanding? I'm more so thinking of on the spiritual path, we can start separating good from bad. So we start identifying that a routine and a sadhana is good. And if we miss that, there's this shame that comes in and we sort of do that. And we know that if we're doing our sadhana, that will feel good. Whereas we see people in the world and worldly sort of things, and there's this aversion and separation that's created. So if we were, if we had realized that we were not the doer, then we would be unaffected in either, in any state that we were at. So does this realization come through direct experience only? Uh, in its fullness, yes, I would say, but, but, but only I'm not so sure that, uh, I mean, it seems to me like that shame didn't need to be there anyway, uh, or any kind of guilt or remorse. It's, it's, it's more that when, when the Western man and mankind, women, uh, when they're brought up against uh, Eastern monasticism, then they feel some shame and and so forth about their their way of life and their 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 forgetfulness of God. When an Eastern way of proceeding, especially in the monasticism or monastic circles, that the mind has been taken away from the world and put entirely on God. Uh, so maybe that kind of shame and so forth doesn't rise in that kind of atmosphere. But in our Western culture, yes, it, it, it does rise uh, as we try and tear ourselves or take our minds away from so much of percentage of the mind away from the world and start to balance it out and place more and more of our mind on divine reality. <clears throat> if you want to just put it plainly, uh, thinking about God more often, which is why we're here today on the satsang talking about Dharma. Dharma is one of the best ways of taking the mind uh, away from its lower runs and, and uh, putting it on, on uh, high mindedness all the time. Uh, like Sri Krishna talking about the difference between a hot air balloon and rainfall. <laughs> one settles down to the lowest place and the other is always rising. So he's using that uh, as a as a metaphor for keeping the mind, uh, which it, its penchant quite often is to fall into low places like shame and guilt and fear and doubt, uh, and uh, charging up the chitta, he says, uh, is taking your thoughts as if you could plug them into a into a socket or something, and just charging them up daily, so uh, they never fall into these lower atmospheres. And, depression and all those things that people are going through. So um, yes, I would say direct spiritual experience is the best way if you if you can get it. Um, but there's also the way of, uh, of uh, Krama Mukti or getting enlightenment by stages that like you're just you're describing this right now. And so you're aware of it. Uh, but yeah, if yeah, uh, in, in that way, then it needs to be looked into and, and you need to, to uh, by stages, do your sadhana, keep up your practice until that kind of mind 
uh, set or that kind of problem or karma goes away completely. And uh, I would say that things like shame and grief and so forth, are, those are called the three great traps in India. And uh, they, they're titled that way so that you can recognize them and avoid them and um, get that very self same insight that you're asking about uh, because the mind can be its own worst enemy. Otherwise it, it can fall into uh, obsessing with problems that are there, uh, sort of like um, complaining about darkness in a cave when you could just fly the torch. So the uh, mind has this tendency towards darkness, but it has the ability towards light. Sharon Krishna used to say that, uh, that um, the mind can be either the gateway to heaven or the doorway to hell. And and that that's up to the individual to use that antakarna or the body mind mechanism or the psychophysical being or the uh, eightfold prakriti or whatever however you want to call it said in different systems to use it in the most advantageous way and uh, then keep it balanced as we started out saying about sattva and uh, it's a sort of challenge to yourself and to your ego, as you're talking about there. It's just, just to not let it uh, insinuate itself in negative ways upon your thinking process and therefore your actions. Thought is father to the deed. So we have to make sure that uh, we pre-think things. That's true not only of philosophy, but it's also true of even moving outside the door of our house each day. It's good to have precognition or uh, sort, sort of like you can send your mind ahead into physical locations as a, as a sort of uh, watchman, you see, a sentinel, you're a messenger. You go ahead of me, mind, and make, make, make everything ready for my physical appearance. It's sort of like uh, Christ's message to everyone. I've, I've, I've gone to prepare a way in heaven. Well, you need to do that with every thought and every act you do here on earth. Um, there are things waiting for you, you see, that, that are both negative and positive. Uh, like I can give you an example. Yesterday, I walked out on the deck of my house here and I reached down and opened the screen and uh, held hands with a yellow jacket. <laughs> he was hiding in the handle of my screen. And so he bit me right here on my hand, you see, and I drew my hand back with this pain and saw this yellow jacket fall out in the ground. And then I carefully conducted him outside into nature and let him loose there. But um, there's, you never know what's happening. And uh, so if you, you can actually turn a, turn a, a sword stroke into a pinprick, as Holy Mother used to say, if you think things ahead of time before you move, jumping into things recklessly or without any forethought in the matter is one of the ways in which you, you know you can encounter all of these, these potential traps in life that you can easily walk into. So you want to, as much as possible, reduce all of that risk you can't get rid of it all, something's going to get through, but uh, you can, by using your consciousness, you can prepare the way for uh, things that, uh, to bring all good things to you and to others and to put off all these negativities that really needn't happen. Pain is a good teacher, That's a we know that's a lesson, but there's no reason why we shouldn't transcend pain in the end. It doesn't mean, oh, I've got to go and rush and hold pain just to keep myself uh, taught well. You see, <laughs> at a certain time, we want to trade in pain for, for bliss, for peace of mind, and then for bliss. And then that can stay constant all the time. And you won't have to think about the backs and forths of good and bad and pleasure and pain so much. You can, you can be even-minded. And it's in that even-minded state where 
things that bite and sting you, you know, can be easily accepted and uh, transcended. Saraswati has a question. Good morning. Good morning, Babaji, um, and everyone else, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so you actually just mentioned bliss, which is something that I've been thinking about. Um, I've been contemplating the nature of bliss, and I feel like the way that I understand bliss is that it's not it's not happiness. It's not like a feeling. It's the foundation of all happiness. It's the source of all pleasant experiences because it's an innate quality of Brahman. All pleasant experiences that we have are due to that bliss that is innate to Brahman. Um, and so in thinking about that, um, I was thinking about negative experiences and my conclusion was that all negative experiences all draw, draw forth from ignorance. Would that be a reasonable conclusion to make or am I not thinking about that correctly? That makes sense. Yes, I, I think, um, and India is probably the only nation and religion that thinks this way, that everything comes from ignorance. <laughs> everything in form comes from a certain kind of ignorance. Other religions and so forth like to think of everything coming from love. And uh, where that might be true in an ultimate sense in India, like that bliss, uh, it's, not, it, it's usually not the case in the, in the seven worlds that is in the three worlds and uh, what lies beyond them or the seven chakras, the three lower chakras. We, we really see a lot of pain and suffering ongoing all the time in those worlds. So it's a little bit impractical may, maybe to think that, you know, that and, and untenable to believe that God makes people suffer. It's, it's really the mind's projections in, out of ignorance that make them, they make themselves suffer. So we can't pass that blame on to some high and mighty power or try and pass it on to the Divine Mother, who's the Shakti in it all, who's trying to lift us out of it, but we won't listen. And we just go on in our old ways. So the conclusions of the seers, all of them in India, you know, is that all of this is springing from a kind of ignorance. Now, as far as what you say about, uh, about uh, negativities, you might want to take a few exceptions to that because it depends on the level of consciousness you're at. You can be at a level of consciousness as a beginner and you could pretty much say that these negativities are things that are coming to me based in my own karma. That would be a good way to start uh, in, in neutralizing your karma. But as, as consciousness gets more refined and uh, it occupies uh, minds that are more awakened, uh, uh, then negativities sort of change their nature and find out that these souls are beginning to take on negativities that are not their own. They begin to um, take on the karmas of the collective mind uh, and the ancestors. And you see those things getting worked out here on earth. So you might as well just uh, make the conclusion that that's also coming from the subtle realms, the, the heavenly realms too, is that it's just a kind of trade-off that the ancestors are doing with the humans. And uh, so in that case, the negativity begins to change its nature a little bit. And, and you know, that's where you find Swami Vivekananda uh, uh, making such powerful statements like his, his poem to Mother Kali, he whom misery loves and hugs the form of death, to him the mother comes. So it's like pretty soon you become such a, a giant magnet for negativity that uh, you become Shiva. Shiva destroys worlds uh, at the end of cycles. And while cycles are going on, he's busy destroying things too, if you take refuge in him. Uh, he's the consort of Kali. And, and uh, so 
basically those two are working in the cremation ground of the human mind, destroying things to ashes. And then they smear the ashes on themselves. You see like, like ascetics do and uh, go about with uh, emptiness as their main state of mind, Shiva yoga. So that's how negativity can march forward from, from a very karma-based thing to a collective transmutation kind of thing to um, a way of destroying everything that isn't God. When you talk about emptiness, really what you're talking about is you've got rid of everything that wasn't God. That means what? Everything that changes. So there's only one thing that doesn't change and that's Brahman. So until you find it, you're somewhat still a lost soul trying to learn your lessons. And that's where negativity becomes such a powerful teacher. And it's just that you want to probably hurry up and get out of the beginning stages of it and begin to use it as a powerful tool to purify yourself. We know that pain's a better teacher than pleasure. <clears throat> the people who are lost in the pleasure gardens uh, have rude awakenings all the time going to happen to them uh, with no lessons learned out of them. And people complain about that. <clears throat> oh, the rich, the famous and all that, they never have to suffer. Oh, well, you're, you're seeing their suffering right there when they're enjoying things that aren't real all around them, houses, cars, families, foods, whatever it is, that's their suffering they're going through. But you don't see the yogis enjoying those things, whether they have them or not. They're just living in an even state of mind, which is called Brahman or Brahman consciousness or Brahmananda uh, or, um, or uh, living, abiding in their Atman and offering everything to the Divine Mother, Shakti, everything, even the wisdom that comes. So um, a good question, and I think that's an adequate answer. Yes, thank you. I realize now that I was thinking of uh, negativities in a, I think you uh, deepened my understanding of how to think about negativities in general. So thank you. Yes. And, and that bliss that you mentioned in and amongst it all, uh, that can also come from, it probably won't come, put it this way, it probably won't come until you empty everything else that's competing with it out of your mind. If you still are clinging to some pleasures and bliss, you know, will just leave you alone. It's when you really are just bereft of everything that uh, that emptiness, which is bliss, comes to the soul. And uh, Sharam Krishna said, uh, I was a great bird flying in the Mahakasha. Well, you know, there's five Akashas. One's physical, one's energy, one's mind and thought and intelligence. And one's the bliss of the ego, uh, basically. But behind, behind, beyond those five Akashas, there's the Mahakasha, the great Akasha of consciousness. So when he got beyond the five Akashas and the, the boundaries went away, then he... He was a great bird, he said, flying in the great Mahakasha. And that's bliss there. there. There was nothing there to describe. It was just the bliss of oneness. And nobody's come out of that state to, to tell us what it's like because words fail it. It's where you go, vacha, uh, yata vacho nivartante aprapya manasa saha ananda brahmanam vidvan nabibeti Shankara says in his scriptures, this is basically means that Brahman from which words and thoughts and mind all fall back in awe, unable to describe. Uh, the one who knows the bliss of that Brahman uh, destroys doubt and fear for all times. And so it is. So <clears throat> that's, or let's see, maybe that's from the Upanishads, but quoted by others like Vivekananda and Shankara. So you have that uh, on good record, let's say, that um, bliss comes from negativity, like Shiva's bliss, comes from a kind of negativity 
we call it negation in Vedanta or iti or neti, neti. See, not this, not this, it's not this. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. It, oh, there it's something that doesn't change. There's the light. I'll accept that. And then you give yourself to it. But people are giving themselves to all sorts of masqueraders and imposters, and including the ego, their own egos. That's why we take a teacher in Vedanta and in India particularly, because our own ego can't teach us. And if we think it can, then uh, as my teacher used to say, you're a first class fool. <laughs> That's what he'd say to you. Yes, Jerry. Uh, namaste, Babaji. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, my question had uh, has something to do with, um, with, with discernment and um, purification. Um, uh, I was listening to, I think it was the gospel of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, uh, and there was a passage about a proverb of uh, like the mad elephant where one of the aspirants was uh, thinking about how God would never hurt God. And there he was walking down the side of a road and there was a mad elephant that came and he was thinking, and there was a man on top of the mad elephant saying, get out of the way, it's a mad elephant. And he's like, well, if the mad elephant's God and I'm God, the mad elephant won't hurt me. And the mad elephant trampled him and he went like beat up to his um, his guru and he's like, well, why didn't you listen to God on top of the elephant? Um, and I've been trying, uh, I, I, I've been trying to do my best to listen to discernment and like logic. And also at this, like throughout my whole life, throughout my daily life and I, I'm, I'm just at this point of purifying and trying to purify stuff to be able to receive messages. And um, there's a lot of people chattering out here. Yes, that's for sure. Called the media and so forth. <clears throat> um, so the, the confluence of opinions um, uh, really have to find cut your own path and find your own way and and do so with discernment it's or we call that of course spiragium or detachment <clears throat> and that's a good story that you cite from the gospel um, of the mad elephant you reminded me of it after a while of not thinking of it <laughs> so <clears throat> so yes we must listen to the um counsel of uh, somebody who's detached from when, when we're so involved in our lives and, and its happenings. It's very hard to remain objective in the midst of life and its various happenings, both positive and negative. You can get swept away in happiness and you can get swept away in sorrow. <clears throat> so to have an objective person there uh, who's looking on and witnessing and giving counsel, that's the best part of Good or Dharma and Sangha, they call it, or or Buddha Dharma Sangha in Buddhism. So that holy company that you have uh, of Guru on one side and and your fellow practitioners around you on the other sides, um, along with the revealed scriptures, those are really what uh, Indian darshanas are holding up to us uh, as. You know, probably along with mantra, you know, as the most viable and, and effective ways of getting ourselves into a state of evenness, evenness of mind. It, when the mind's even, it, it, uh, everything that's headed for, for it by way of karma just can't find it anymore. <clears throat> There's a beautiful song in India that the, the god of karma and the god of death uh, you know, they, they both went looking for this man when he died so that they could level karma and, and death and all those things upon him. But he was an illumined soul before he died. So death and karma couldn't find him anymore. So that means he really had no mind anymore. He had the no mind that you hear about. So things that went looking for him couldn't find him. 
So that's, I guess you could call that in English, pure transparency in a good way, uh, using that term in a good way is that things just can't find you when you stay calm, peaceful, non-emotional, steady, uh, uh, transparent. And, uh, and you're probably going to need to have witness consciousness in order to be able to hold that. And so your guru has that witness, witness consciousness through experience. A good guru would, uh, an authentic one. And uh, so, in that way, it's a it's a very good thing you bring up here to to help accent the need for the what we call the triple gem in Tibetan Buddhism. That is Ayu Punya Jnana. You need life, wisdom, and then peace and bliss will come. And uh, <clears throat> that, uh, of course, is a part of a mantra. So that mantra you got from your guru and uh, called a Toku or Rinpoche in that in that particular tradition, and, and so you got it on good faith again that uh, this is these are the things to be reaching for, and uh, <clears throat> there's another elephant story where man is gets on his elephant like we would get in our car <clears throat> one morning gets on his elephant and he's up high and can see everything so he can see over his neighbor's fence he sees his neighbor there out in the garden. So he leans over the fence and starts talking to his neighbor from the top of his elephant. And uh, so they start talking and, and so while they're talking, the elephant sees the neighbor's bananas growing in a tree right there across the fence in his neighbor's yard. So it, it just, the elephant just reaches out its trunk, you know, and starts to grab those bananas. And without even a, a moment's lapse in the conversation between the two, the elephant driver just takes his goad and whacks the trunk of the elephant lightly, you know, no, don't do that. And the elephant withdraws its trunk back, you know, from, from taking those bananas from his neighbor. So that story is, is meant to mean holy company. Uh, you know, it means that um, you learn what to do and what not to do when you're in the presence of a teacher. And of course, for human beings, <clears throat> we should have known long ago, you shouldn't steal the things of others. An elephant doesn't know that, doesn't have a sign, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of uh, possession to things. But, but human beings go into the company of, of gurus and teachers and acharyas and so forth, and they'll learn how not to think about something. Uh, like uh, my religion is better than yours or something like that. If they, they go into the company of universal minded gurus with the wrong thoughts, then they'll hear the guru talking in the opposite way. And they'll say, oh, I thought, I didn't know I was thinking wrong about that. I should change my view. See? And so uh, those kinds of things happen in, in holy company with, with a good teacher. So elephant stories are good ones. Thank you for sharing that. And we have some 20 minutes left, I think, for our remainder of our satsang. Looks like Michaela is just ready to give a question any moment. I think I always have about 18 questions, but uh, the one on my mind this week has been that when I first learned to meditate, it was with a view to calming the mind so that it would be ready for contemplation. And so I find recently that when I'm sitting in meditation, I do seem to naturally slip into really connecting with the question of form and formlessness and really starting to connect to what I think I language as the silence between the sounds. And I don't know if this is a good sign and I should just allow that to happen or whether I'm just developing a bad habit and I should come back to my focus of meditation. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, flexibility is the, is the watchword amongst Vedantists anyway. Uh, 
but uh, again, depending on the stage of of graduation or lack thereof of your particular uh, mind and consciousness, uh, you might want to uh, you know you'll keep a, an eye out for for habits like that stealing in. I think basically it's it's different it's difficult to distinguish between uh, a habit of getting stuck in meditation on form as compared to being flexible and and using both as a as viable means for constant for meditation practice in in Sri Ramakrishna Loka as we live in uh, the latter is the case is that we really use the mantra and concentrate fully on him and on Holy Mother but then we're told to put the mantra the beads down and, and once our mind is has been focused in a great bridge like Sri Ramakrishna and then try and place our attention on the light of, of Brahman formless reality so that's not a problem <laughs> uh, I think if you didn't have the instruction from uh, uh, from your guru who is like a swami of the Ramakrishna order like like I had uh, if you didn't have that instruction and you just went ahead and did that anyway then maybe you'd you know you you'd be thinking uh, am I doing this right or am I doing something wrong but if you've been given the permission to do both then it becomes fine to do both so I think that that's kind of comes with the territory with a great Mahacharya like Sri Ramakrishna a teacher of teachers and said uh, that's what he is exemplified therefore that's what you must follow too and can do that with all goodwill and open-mindedness um, if you find yourself concentrating more and longer on god with form then it's there's no problem in that in in our tradition um, that just means is that you're you're gaining satiation as it were of of uh, that divine form. You're completing your darshan or your communion. Like say, for instance, Arjuna in the Gita, he didn't even really know who Krishna was until the battlefield. He, he thought he was a great king. He thought he was his friend, but he didn't know he was the Lord of the worlds, Maheshwara, Loka Maheshwaram. So then he got this instruction during a difficult period and found out that Sri Krishna was was all that and more, and he even got the vision of Vishwarupa Darshanam from him. Saw how powerful he was inside. So uh, that um, you know it is that uh, that uh, great teacher there himself exemplifying uh, both Ishvara and Brahman. Uh, and it's it's too bad that there are people who pit those two against each other i think it's just idiocy myself it's not natural but uh you know you, you should be able to get to the father through the son the christians have that right at least so you know you, you have this great god in form and then you move on forward to as a doorway into brahman foremost reality If I understood your question right, then anyway, that's, I hope that was an answer. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Nikhil has one. That little room there with the third eye in back of it. You know, it's, it's uh, full of questions today. Namaste, Babaji. Um, my question has to do with the Brihadaranyaka. I, uh, Upanishad, I, I began to read that, or I've begun to read that, and I, I just wanted some clarity on something that was said in it. Um, pretty early on, they talk about chanting the Udgita, which, Udgita, which I am not completely sure of. I hadn't heard of Udgita before, but I looked it up, and I think it has it's similar to chanting Om, I'm assuming. But so anyway, they have 
the practitioner chant the Udgita with the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. So all of the sense organs and then with the mind and with all of those, the asuras come rushing in and, and then they equate what the asuras are with those sense organs. So like with speech, it's speaking poorly or out against something in the wrong way or hearing negative things or seeing bad things or having negative thoughts. But then they bring it to the vital force and they say, chant the Udgita with the vital force and the asuras come rushing into that. And it's as good, and the asuras are just obliterated. It's as good as throwing a clot of earth at, or a clot of dirt at a stone mountain. So they just get obliterated. So is that saying that, is that because the vital force is the divine mother in essence? And there, you cannot, you can't do harm with that force. I, I just need kind of clarity on what, what was being said there. And I can read the um, sloka if you want, but. No, that's all right. You explained it quite well. And I would, I would agree with you. It, it is because prana is really uh, divine mothers. The problem with it is, you know, that I would say, I, I would say no to the last part of the question or, or what you were just saying is that uh, the prana can be used for negativity, no doubt can be used for horrible things. And, uh, uh, you know, for instance, somebody came to Sri Krishna who had just been to America and England and Sri Krishna never went. So he asked, well, what are the Europeans and Americans doing? Oh, they're building ships for battle. You should see it. They're just, uh, their harbors are full and they're massing things and they're working so hard and you know, and, and he was, the man was telling him all this as if it were a horrible thing. And Sri Ramakrishna said, well, sounds like they're worshipers of Shakti to me. So Sri Ramakrishna was looking at Shakti as this overall force for creating things and, you know, doing things. And he wasn't looking at it so much as uh, at, from the level of these things are going to cause harm to people or these things are going to cause good to people because he was beyond good and bad. He didn't care what happened in the world. The world wasn't real. He was outside the world all the time. There's only people who have to think about those things. And I'm not saying they shouldn't think about those things. As long as they're in the world, then they have to think about morality and immorality and virtue and vice and you know how to make their way through the world. But a person who's made his way through the world already and transcended the worlds, they're gonna look at everything as Shakti, whether it destroys or whether it creates because there's no birth and no death, you see. And they know that. We don't know that. You know, we're not that sure of it quite often. So you know, you know, we're gonna get all up, up in arms about the latest little germ that comes around. Everyone's gonna disagree and it's all gonna be like much ado about nothing. And they're just sitting back and, and going, gee, what's happened to humanity this last you know, year or two? So anyway, with that said, um, back to the, 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 the sewers getting destroyed in prana, that means that a person, the Upanishad, by the way, good luck with getting through that Upanishad, that's a huge work. Uh, you can tell me about it in 10 years when you get done with it. But what the Upanishad is trying to say is that um, a person who has taken the senses and purified them, uh, knows about pure prana then, doesn't he or she? So the so that person's consciousness is already high when the asuras come running to try and attack the prana. The person who is in the process of that is at risk of the asuras getting in and spoiling the picnic, you see. So again, almost every question I've been asked today can be answered by that. It all depends upon the level of your consciousness. It all depends on how you're using the mind, prana, and senses. Uh, whether, as to whether they're going to be at risk and bring you suffering and ignorance, or they're going to bring you uh, transcendence and, uh, and contentedness and uh, things of that nature. 
It really just all depends upon the individual's consciousness. And there's a good example of it right there. The person with strong prana is impervious to the ancestors and the asuras and to the gods eventually too. <laughs> the gods can't influence him. Thank you. That person is a free soul, a Jivan Mukta. So uh, yeah, uh, they don't uh, have to follow the Vedas anymore. They stand at the head of the Vedas, to quote Vivekananda. The sannyasin stands at the head of the Vedas. He's a walking Veda. And uh, so that's much better than uh, letters on a page. And so with some seven minutes left, we're squeezing the most juice out of our orange, as Vivekananda used to say. He said that to Nikola Tesla, I know how to squeeze more juice out of my orange. So um, this means, uh, you know, not just get all caught up in electricity, but purify your prana, which is a different kind of electricity and use that for deeper insight. Babaji, uh, namaste. Namaste. Just, uh, trying to un unmute and ask a question here amongst all the questions. Uh, I, I, this is one of my first questions that came up at the beginning of the satsang, which is uh, whether or not um, a Western man born in a Western society and brought up amongst uh, Western parents and Western culture um, and uh, fuse Western thought with Eastern philosophy, if that is a good, uh, uh, how do they call it, uh, hybrid um, for, uh, hybrid uh, for uh, future generations and uh, how uh, so 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 uh, yeah I so, think it's better to be a, better to be a hybrid than a hypocrite you know because in the West in America particularly we don't have anywhere to go philosophically or religiously there's just nothing here except money and as that was Vivekananda's criticism of us he loved us he thought we were generous. He said the only problem is the dollar is their religion. And uh, that's what they seek, matter. And uh, so you're looking at me right now. You're looking at a person who's a hybrid, if you want to put it that way. He said, when I was 20, I heard that the Darshanas of India, and I went towards him and never looked back. And so right now I'm the product of, of uh, a Western birth blended with Eastern wisdom, if you want to put it that way. And there are others of us out there like that too, that uh, heard the truth and the truth set them free and, and they, didn't, uh, they didn't need to hear anything else. It's, it wasn't a matter anymore of I've got my truth and you've got your truth. It was a matter of I have the truth now. And uh, so, with that truth, I'll put to death all sorts of superstitions and I'll go straight to the goal. Uh, I have a, a light now free of all hocus pocus is how Vivekananda put it to one person once. So all the superstitions of religion had gotten burned away by the light of seeing Brahman. And he actually had the advantage of seeing Brahman in Ramakrishna too. Uh, uh, so in that way, then you had this uh, these examples that, that came here, you, you might say that Vivekananda was a hybrid of a different kind. He was a hybrid of uh, Eastern man being, being introduced to the Western cultures. You know, a, 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 lamb, a lamb thrown to the wolves, as it were. And uh, like Jesus was, you see, only, uh, of course, that happened all in his own country. But 
if, if you have East and West brought together like that, the, the only way to do it in these day and times is to make a good hybrid out of it. And some hybrids work and some don't. I know that from being a musician, that you can put together some kinds of music and it'll be very wonderful. Other kinds, forget it, it's horrible. And uh, you just drop it like a hot potato. So um, in that way, uh, I would say yeah, a big yes to your, to your question that it would be very good for Americans and Europeans both to take up this banner that Vivekananda has brought to us and march forward with it um, because there are plenty of good things in the West. I know you hear me criticize it a lot, but I don't think I'm overlooking the positive qualities of Westerners. Um, uh, the, you're talking about powerful nations there. So if we can convince powerful nations to have more compassion and to seek spirituality, then it'll be better for every country in the world, just like Buddhism was, I mean, talk about hybrids. How many different <laughs> countries did Buddhism go to walking on two legs of the mendicants, you know, convincing kings to become vegetarians and various things like that. And, uh, it went everywhere, even all the way to Japan. And, uh, and look at the beautiful things it produced in Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism is big now. Tibetan Buddhism was big before. Zen Buddhism was big before that. So uh, it, they've all come to America and America has, has taken them uh, on a rather surface level, I would say, but some people have gone deep into them. Those are the ones we want to, to encourage and uh, because they can influence more people to, to try out these, these uh, wisdom religions. If we did have anything in America, and if we did have anything in Europe that wasn't jaded after a while, you know, uh, it was uh, a truly faith-based religion. But the wisdom-based religions are different. We need to add them in. I mean, I, I'm more, not saying... That, that's more than a hybrid. You know, that's, that, that's like integrated religion, you're talking about Ramakrishna level things then. I'm not saying that it's bad, but I wasn't saying it in a negative context or anything because no, I... I wasn't taking it that way. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wasn't taking it that way. I was, I was uh, agreeing with you. It's a, it's a, good, a good thing to uh, develop one, many sides of oneself, not stay one-sided. My watch keeps the only right time, right? That's how Sri Ramakrishna put that narrow, narrow religious view. And my watch says that it's nine o'clock here in 9 a.m. in Hawaii. So it's time for us to close and we will go on for an hour's break, take some prasad food, think about Brahman and come back and, and help us um, dissect some of these God blogs and, and squeeze some more juice out of our orange. Om Brahmanandam Kijai.